NerdRotic.com. Welcome back to NerdRotic. My name is Gary Beekler, and I come to you from NerdRotic.com. And 10 Reasons Star Trek Discovery is the best Star Trek spinoff. No, I did not hit you with clickbait. I agree with Screen Rant's 10 Reasons, but I do not agree with the conclusions. Now, I read this article on a live stream last night, and it reads like a tourist brochure pre-written by the marketing team of CBS and handed to Alan Carson of Screen Rant. Screen Rant, which is currently in the running with comicbook.com to be the number one Star Trek Discovery shill site, which doesn't bode well for comicbook.com, which is owned by CBS. The amount of shill Alan Carson has managed to compress into one article is breathtaking. Premiering in 2017, Star Trek Discovery has brought Trek back to television after a long hiatus. After such a long wait, fans were eager to see the next spin-off of the franchise. There were sure to be fans on both sides declaring why it was the worst Trek yet. I agree with that. Or something new and exciting. I don't agree with that. Overall, the show has been extremely well received by both critics and fans, and it deserves the praise. Discovery brings the franchise back to the small screen in an impressive way, and it's constantly improving as well. As a prequel to the original series, Discovery offers a look at the beginning of Star Trek while also paving the way for the future of the beloved series. With such a spectacular start, Discovery is on its way to becoming one of the best installments of the show we've ever had. Discovery has given a huge boost to CBS. With all the success, they recently ordered a third season of the show, showing no signs of stopping. We're excited to see what else the show runners have to offer. With a bright future ahead, Star Trek Discovery has already cemented itself as one of the biggest pieces of crap on television. Oh, I'm sorry. It says, uh, uh, what does it say here? Oh, uh, has cemented itself as one of the best spin-offs we've ever had. I'm going to try to continue reading this with a straight face, but we also have to bring up the fact that it doesn't really talk about, and it's worth talking about if it's such a great show, all the adversity it's overcome with all the showrunners it's had coming in and out, all the writers it's had, cast changes. Remember, this was supposed to be released with CBS All Access, and it was supposed to boost their subscriber count, and it has been proven, in my opinion, that they have been fudging their subscriber numbers while lumping in Showtime subscribers with theirs. They initially made a statement that they had 8 million subscribers, but it turns out 4 million of them were with Showtime. Something they probably had to come out and say because they have shareholders they need to be, by law, honest with. But this article also fails to mention the budget problem problems this show has. In each season, it's gone over budget. Each season has cost roughly around $10 million an episode, and the problems they had with season two, using up most of the budget in the first few episodes. And what is Alan Carson of Screen Rant's number 10 reason why Star Trek, in his opinion, is the best Star Trek spinoff ever? Budget. Allen states, one of the major benefits of Star Trek's return to television has been the budget that has been given to the show. The production quality is through the roof, and you can definitely tell the difference in every episode. While Star Trek has never been a show that is supposed to focus on how good everything looks, it certainly doesn't hurt. Discovery puts the budget to good use and delivers a series that feels almost like a movie. Yeah, it feels almost like those J.J. Abram movies, the Star Trek franchise that crashed and burned, the one that went over budget, the one that used excessive lens flares that people mocked, fans and critics alike. And to state the obvious, what everybody knows, it's not how much money you throw at something, it's how it is spent. And if you would have spent the money on a Ronald D. Moore or Rand Shankar or Mark Zickery, you probably would have gotten a better show. Number nine, incredible acting. Alan states, again, while it's certainly not the main focus of a show like Star Trek, it definitely doesn't hurt to have some incredible performances. The acting in this show has been spot on and really helped to deliver some of the more crucial moments. Notice Alan doesn't give any specifics because he can't, because it's incredible how bad the acting is in this show. Impressively enough, Sonequa Martin-Green has managed to add a third facial expression almost two seasons in. We, of course, have Michelle Yao's horrible performance as Captain Emperor Georgiou, a performance equal to when your mom dresses up as a madam for Halloween and tries to act sexy in front of the kids. And who could forget Jason Isaac's horrible George Bush impression? And what's lost in this is the wonderful Doug Jones wasted on this show. In the actor's defense, I can't see how anybody could perform well with this writing. Number eight, it brings something new, and it certainly does. While past Trek has sucked at times, Star Trek Discovery has sucked so 
so consistently, it has become a singularity of suck. But Alan states, one of Star Trek's biggest challenges was adapting to modern television. Since the prime Trek days, television has changed dramatically, becoming much more focused on longer plots and character development. Star Trek does a fantastic job of becoming a modern take on a classic show. While keeping the charm of the original, Alan starts writing like a caveman here, it brings Star Trek into modern age and allows show to keep up with other shows. Insinuating that Star Trek as a franchise has fallen behind. Star Trek that has been around for over five decades is a shadow of its former self or old fashion. Au contraire, Alan Carson. While I do believe the Star Trek fandom is aging out a bit, it's only because they haven't brought out anything new recently. I don't think it has anything to do with the aesthetic. The reason it's lasted over five decades is because the old Trek style, good writing, over aesthetic is what has kept the show alive. But when you hire hacks, this is the result you get. And again, we hear that Star Trek Discovery is a show for people who don't like Star Trek. And that brings us to number seven, callbacks to older shows. While Discovery definitely brings something new to the table, it doesn't forget where it came from either. With tons of callbacks to previous shows and Easter eggs for fans to search for, Discovery doesn't abandon the long history of the franchise. And here is where I think this is an article pre-written by the CBS marketing team and handed off to Alan Carson. And the reason they didn't hand it off to comicbook.com because it would look too obvious. Well, I'm sorry. This reads a lot like the article that was an advertisement in the New York Times. This is a point counterpoint to every criticism this show has without giving any specifics. When Alan does get specific, he gets it wrong. A major example of this is the inclusion of Captain Pike, which fans were happy to see the return of. Discovery finds the perfect balance of standing on its own while also paying homage. Really, is it paying homage to have Captain Pike constantly with his hands folded over his genitals, looking passive, and asking Michael Burnham permission to be a captain? Six, it maintains the focus on ideals. Ultimately, Star Trek has always been a show about staying true to certain ideals, even in the face of adversity. The show, at its best, shows how difficult it can be to follow a certain path when there are difficult choices that you have to make. Discovery stays true to this and puts the characters in situations where their ideas Ideals and values are tested. That paragraph was a word salad of gobbledygook. So what you're trying to tell me is Star Trek Discovery is a television show with actors, with actors who play characters, who are put in situations to create drama, to entertain people. How groundbreaking. Number five, the cast. One of the biggest strengths of Star Trek Discovery all the way back to the original series was leading the way for bringing a diverse and interesting cast onto the screen. Discovery is no exception to this, and the cast of the show is not only extremely likable, but present a wide range of characters from all different backgrounds. Though it is a show with aliens, Discovery stays true to Trek and represents all of humanity. Again, I beg to differ. Old Trek used to try to represent the best of humanity. What Star Trek Discovery represents with this great cast is the worst of humanity. I wonder what part of humanity, or maybe Hollywood, Captain Emperor Georgiou represents being a cannibal space Nazi, but I will have to admit to one thing. I think the majority of the audience that still watches Star Trek Discovery and enjoys it identifies with Tilly. And the addition of a gay relationship in Star Trek Discovery with Stamets and Calder, while I believe it was lifted from the Tardigrades game by our friend Anas Abdeen, is only told on a perfunctionary level. Number four, it's fun! While Star Trek has always been a show that focuses on ideas and philosophical questions, there's no denying that it is nice to see Discovery actually bring some fun to the franchise. The recent movies did a great job of showing how Trek could be a good time, and Discovery follows up on that success. It's often overlooked in modern media, but sometimes there is nothing wrong with a show being fun and a wild ride. Wasn't it fun when they severed the Klingon baby head? Wasn't it fun when all the Klingons ate Philippa Georgiou after Mikey Spock left her body on the Klingon ship when they both geniusly decided to go down and kidnap a 300-pound Klingon, two 5'3", 5'4", women weighing 110 pounds 
soaking wet, taking on 300-pound Klingons and almost winning. So big surprise that after they killed Philippa Georgiou, they ate her. But it was probably a little gamey, and I don't know how much meat was actually on those bones anyway. And who could forget the fun of, in the same season, Philippa Georgiou eating a Kelpian? There's a lot of people and alien eating in this fun show. Who can forget them dropping F-bombs? Such a fun show. Bring the kids. Who could also forget Vok Tyler's torture and rape by Laurel and ridged Klingon boobies? Number three, The Optimism. Though Discovery certainly has its more serious moments, the show maintains what has always been the core of Star Trek optimism for the future. A major part of the success of the franchise has been the hope that the future will be a better place. One focused on exploration and bringing peace throughout the universe. Discovery doesn't lose sight of this core value of Trek and it shines throughout the show. Holy crap. I can't go on. I know there's only two more to go, but this is so shiltastic. Alan, I'm starting to get concerned for you, buddy. I'm starting to get concerned about your self-worth and your integrity because it is lost in this article. As a matter of fact, this sounds like a copy and pasted memo from the members of Bad Reboot and, of course, Secret Hideout to the new board members of CBS to justify the existence of the show, hoping and praying that these board members don't ever actually watch it. Star Trek Discovery is a bleak and hopeless universe filled with unlikable characters, and we need to look no further than the main character of the show, Mikey Burnham, an unlikable know-it-all, whose only flaw was ever trusting a man. And it is unfortunate in the one show that thinks it's more diverse than the previous Star Treks when it's really not, depicts Starfleet as somewhat of a matriarchy, and this is by far the worst representation of Starfleet ever put on television or film. Number two, it takes risks. While in one instance, I will agree with Alan on this, we will not agree on the conclusion. With it being so long since Star Trek has been on television, it would be understandable if the show tried to play it safe, even with a massive fan base, not so massive anymore, that was sure to critique every choice. Discovery hasn't been afraid to take risks with the show. The risks haven't always paid off, but for the most part, they have been well appreciated. It shows the confidence that the showrunners had bringing the franchise back to the small screen and the show really benefits from the risks that are taken. Now, I will agree it was a risk, in my opinion, stealing your initial plot from Anas Abdeen and Tardigrades. That is a bit of a risky move. It's out of the box thinking, but it's certainly paid off so far. But we'll see at the end of this lawsuit. It's too bad, Mr. CBS. You almost got away with it if it wasn't for that pesky internet. But if you're actually saying, Alan, that it's risky to have an inclusive and diverse cast in Star Trek, well, they were doing that in the 60s, so that's not very risky. If you're saying it's risky to say the F word in Star Trek, well, that's just basic. That's not very risky. And that's what this show is. It is basic on every level. It is basic with its politics. It's basic with its storytelling. The only thing not basic basic about this show is how bad it sucks. It's really sucked in very intricate ways. I have to admit, it takes a bit of thought to come up with sonar and space. I have to admit, the latest plot with an artificial intelligence wanting to become an artificial intelligence before it becomes an artificial intelligence really takes quite a bit of not thinking. And what is Alan Carson's number one reason why Star Trek Discovery is the best spinoff of the franchise? Twists and turns. Without getting too much into potential spoiler territory, because I wouldn't want to have to give any specifics in my article, Discovery does an amazing job of keeping the audience on their toes with twists and turns throughout the show. Always left guessing at what happens next brings higher stakes to a traditional format of the show. And some of the twists have been genius. And that's where the article ends. So let's talk about these genius twists. Now, when the Red Angel was presented, prior to Star Trek Discovery Season 2 coming out, many of us predicted it was Michael Burnham. And I believe it was going to be Michael Burnham, and they had to change it last minute. The way they wrote in Michael Burnham's mom's plot is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. Michael Burnham's mother was supposed to be killed by the Klingons 20 years prior to Star Trek Discovery. It turns out she had a magic time suit that can not only travel in time, it can travel in space. It has endless fuel and an infinite hard drive. Drive. And here is the crux of our article, and this is why I decided to read all this to you. This is the best example I have come across to date of the shill media. If anybody wonders what it actually is and what it actually does, you direct them to this article. Each point, 1 through 10, is a counterpoint to the criticisms those of us who have been criticizing the show have had 
to the T. And the running theme throughout this article, and with so many other articles I've brought to you on this channel, is that Star Trek needs to be modernized, or Star Trek needs to be made into something else. We need Game of Thrones in space. Well, we have that already with The Expanse, and The Expanse is a far superior show. But Seth MacFarlane has proven that the Star Trek aesthetic still works today. This show wishes it had the following The Orville has right now. This show does not trend on Twitter. Nobody talks about it on Facebook, and the only people consistently talking about it are YouTubers criticizing it, and they should be grateful for that. They should be grateful some of us still care enough about Star Trek to criticize it to try to make it better. Listen, CBS, the people you are coming after are the people you depend on. We subscribe to your streaming services, we buy your DVDs and Blu-rays and your action figures, we fill your convention halls. Do not fuck with us. Please subscribe.